Fred Gomez Carrasco was a notorious drug cartel boss from San Antonio. After years earning millions and running from the cops, Carrasco was serving a life sentence when he decided to break out of the Walls Unit, the oldest prison in Texas. Carrasco and two henchmen took over the prison library. They held teachers and librarians captive as Carrasco bartered for his freedom. Now there's only one way that these people will see the light again, and that's for you to cooperate. The standoff set off one of the worst hostage crises in American history, the 1974 Huntsville Prison Siege. This will be our last day to live if, if, if somebody doesn't come through and help us. They're desperate men and they mean business. He's fixing to shoot me. You know, I'm fixing to die if you don't do something right now. And the rest of us in here are going to die too. These people don't have anything to lose and they're serious. And it's all on tape. Fred, the governor's on for you. The governor wants to talk to you. He can shove it. From Imperative Entertainment, this is Standoff. Dead or alive, I'm going out. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Afghanistan, late 2001, Operation Enduring Freedom. Northern Alliance ground forces, backed by U.S. air support, went on the offensive against the Taliban. The campaign lasted for two months and resulted in victory for the coalition forces. By December 2001, the Alliance had retaken Kabul, Afghanistan's capital, and was regaining control of much of the country. It was during this post-Taliban period that concerns of public safety were at their highest. Taliban fighters may have been mostly defeated, but they weren't gone, and they were still causing havoc. Car bombs were almost a daily occurrence, and they could happen anywhere, at any time. At least 13 people have been killed and many more injured in a car bomb attack. A suicide car bomb has been detonated near the German embassy in Kabul. Killing a huge suicide explosion rocked Kabul's diplomatic quarter just a few hours ago. From the bombing Afghan happened at the height of rush hour, injuring and killing people on their way to work. The suicide blast occurred near Afghanistan's National Security Agency. Private security contractors, humanitarian missions, military operations, all going on while the war-torn country was rebuilding, and Kabul was at the center of it all. Enter Task Force Sabre 7, a specialized team created for one purpose, to kill Osama bin Laden. Their methods were straightforward, hunt, capture, and interrogate senior Taliban officials until they found him. The elite task force consisted of three Americans and a small group of select Afghanis. Their uniforms looked similar to the military uniforms worn by U.S. forces, with the American flag presented clearly on the sleeve. They were armed with machine guns and sidearms, just like the military forces and government security teams. They wore the same dark wraparound sunglasses, and carried themselves with the same bravado. Their pistols were strapped low on the leg, quick draw style. At first glance, Task Force Sabre 7 appeared to be a real military group and would not have stood out much from other teams on the ground. There were, however, a couple of things that set them apart from official military and government teams running operations there. For instance, one of the team was actually a full-time cameraman. The photojournalist was embedded with the task force for a documentary that featured the team's leader, Jack Edema. But perhaps most glaringly, what set Task Force Sabre 7 apart from other groups operating in the area is that they were as covert as an amusement park at night. Even if the operation was not classified, it was rare to get anyone to give an off-the-record, let alone official, statement to the press. Yet, here was a team supposedly operating with full government authorization carrying out sensitive missions, and then offering interviews, video footage, and operational photos to any reporter willing to pay. Jack Edema was without a doubt the loudest and most visible covert operative anyone in Afghanistan had ever seen. He had a reputation in Kabul as a man who loved talking about himself, about his terrorist hunting exploits. He boasted that he was connected to U.S. agencies like the CIA and the Department of Defense, 
and his unusual behavior should have been a glaring red flag that maybe not everything was as legitimate as it appeared. But it would be a few more years before everyone discovered that the wannabe super soldier was actually a certified sociopath. My name is Eric Crosby. Welcome to this episode of True. Jonathan Keith Adema was born in 1956 and raised in upstate New York. Following in his father's military footsteps, he enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1975, a year after graduating from high school. His father had served as a Marine during World War II and was proud of his son's dedication to his country. Inspired by the John Wayne movie, The Green Berets, Adema set his sights on one day joining the Special Forces. But the Vietnam War had just ended when he enlisted, so he never saw combat. He did, however, eventually qualify for the elite fighting force and spent three years as a radio operator in the Special Forces. But after just one term of service, he was honorably discharged and was not permitted to re-enlist. His military record showed him to be anything but a highly disciplined soldier and was riddled with negative performance reviews, infractions, and critical remarks. In one entry to his file, he was accused of, quote, failure to obey orders, being derelict in the performance of his duty, and being disrespectful to a superior commanding officer. Another officer's statement described him as, quote, without a doubt, the most unmotivated, unprofessional, immature enlisted man I have ever known. Despite all this negative feedback, Edema was allowed to join the U.S. Army Reserves. In the Reserves, he was part of the Special Forces again, but this time he was there to provide logistical support, not combat. His time in the reserves was apparently no different from his short-lived career in the regular army. A commanding officer filed a letter of reprimand stating that Edema, quote, consistently displayed an attitude of non-cooperation with persons outside his immediate working environment, disregard for authority and gross immaturity, characterized by irrationality and a tendency toward violence. That report came after he tried attacking a superior officer. In 1981, he was assigned to the Operations and Intelligence Department. The group trained for, among other responsibilities, processing prisoners of war, managing classified material, and preparing special missions. While his time in the Army Reserves was also short-lived, his interest in those areas stayed with him long after being discharged for good in 1984. If you're looking for a new true crime podcast to binge, I've got one for you. Set in Indianapolis in 1977, American Hostage is a suspenseful true story starring John Hamm as Fred Heckman, a beloved radio reporter who is thrust into the middle of a life or death crisis when a hostage taker, Tony Karitzis, demands to be interviewed live on his popular news program. Stay tuned after this episode to hear a preview of American Hostage. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app available 24-hour roadside assistance and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you can save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. Jack Edema never stopped seeing himself as a super soldier, despite an unflattering military career that never saw battle. The closest the war junkie got to seeing action was on the battlefield of paintball, a game he loved. Shortly after his departure from the military, he started a training school called Counter Group Academy, which offered courses in combat tactics and counterterrorism techniques. The school was founded in his hometown of Poughkeepsie, New York, but he claimed that his skills took him around the world. With nothing to support it, Edema stated that he acted as an advisor to the U.S. Department of Defense, traveling to war zones in Central America on several occasions. 
He is known to have done some security work in Thailand and Haiti, although it's not clear to what extent. He was also hired to train police in Lithuania after it left the Soviet Union in 1993. When he got back to the States, he contacted officials at the Pentagon and the FBI, claiming to have knowledge of a massive conspiracy. He advised them that he had discovered the Russian Mafia was planning to move small portable nuclear weapons out of Lithuania and sell them on the black market. Edema said they would be smuggled out in small suitcases and undoubtedly find their way into the hands of terrorists. The officials dismissed the claim, stating that such technology was pure fantasy. However, given the seriousness of the strange claim, authorities started looking into Edema and quickly found out they weren't the only ones. It turned out, a couple years earlier, in May 1991, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, commonly known as the ATF, had been investigating him. They were interested in reports that Jack Edema carried a fake army ID, which showed him as a high-ranking officer. The ATF also investigated why he had been banned from bidding on army contracts in 1990. In the early 1990s, he started Edema Combat Systems, a business that produced paintball equipment that evolved into supplying military clothing to companies that had contracts with the U.S. Army. Unfortunately, Edema had undertaken some seriously shady business practices and was eventually arrested by federal authorities following the ATF investigation. Charged with almost 60 counts of wire fraud, totaling nearly $300,000, in 1994, he was found guilty and sentenced to six years in prison. He was also ordered to repay the damages. This was not the first time Jack Edema had a run-in with the law. In the years leading up to his incarceration, he had been charged with possession of stolen property, conspiracy, unlawful firing of a weapon inside a residential location, assault, resisting arrest, impersonating an officer, disorderly conduct, and writing bad checks. Amazingly, he escaped conviction every time. He was released from his six-year federal sentence in 1997, three years early, and tried to live an uneventful life. He met a woman, fell in love, and got married. The two lived in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where they went into business together, operating Ultimate Pet Resort, a hotel for pets. He also started another business called Special Operations Exposition and Trade Show Inc., which organized events for military equipment suppliers. Jack Edema also spent the years following his time in prison, filing as many lawsuits as he could, some of which were truly ridiculous. The most bizarre case was brought against award-winning film director Steven Spielberg. The $130 million lawsuit argued that Spielberg, along with his production studio, DreamWorks, had used Edema as the basis for George Clooney's character in the 1997 action movie, The Peacemaker. The case was quickly dismissed, and Edema was ordered to pay all legal fees amounting to over $250,000. Edema initiated dozens of lawsuits, most of which were dismissed, but some of which he won, pocketing himself hundreds of thousands of dollars. He did not, however, limit himself to bizarre lawsuits. He also liked to raise alarms with government officials by contacting them with multiple conspiracy theories. For example, in 1998, he contacted authorities claiming that he had uncovered a terrorist plot to assassinate then-President Bill Clinton. He told them that he had found handwritten notes outlining the plan and that it would happen at a summit in Malaysia. That, of course, did not happen. Aside from the constant litigation and conspiracy theories, Edema's businesses were doing well and the couple was living quietly. That all changed on September 11, 2001, when terrorists hijacked planes and used them to attack the United States. Thousands of people died that day, triggering the War on Terror and the largest manhunt in modern history. Our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. Osama bin Laden, founder of the terrorist organization Al-Qaeda, was now the U.S.'s number one most wanted, and Jack Edema announced he was going to find him. Just weeks after the attack, in October 2001, Edema left for Afghanistan. He used a cover story that he was there to deliver humanitarian supplies, and in order to make his cover story look as real as possible, Edema invited a cameraman and producer to join him to film a documentary on his supposed humanitarian work. 
but in actuality, he was there to make military contacts, presumably in an effort to sell military supplies. Things started to go wrong almost right away. Edema and his team were taken into custody before they even reached Afghanistan, when they tried to enter Uzbekistan. Edema did not have the proper documents, but reportedly made a few calls and got things sorted within 24 hours. Within days of reaching Afghanistan, Edema took the documentary team to a hot zone where Taliban fighters were engaging Northern Alliance forces. As the bullets whizzed past their heads and incoming mortar shells got closer, it was only a matter of time before someone got hurt. It was the team's producer that took the worst of it. Injured after a shell exploded nearby, he initially thought that one of his legs had been blown off, but thankfully, it wasn't. The injury was still bad enough for him to be flown out of the country and back to the US for treatment. This fact was not lost on the director of a private charity operating in the area. He had witnessed Adima's recklessness and sent an urgent message to US Army Command. It read, quote, I feel that given the amount of time that he has been allowed to run around telling people that he has been working for the US Embassy, Pentagon, Special Ops, Undercover, or the CIA, that he has garnered or bought enough contacts to pose a real threat to not only me and those near me, but to the overall mission of the United States and the coalition that is fighting there. In an interview given some time later, the director simplified his thoughts about Edema. Quote, he is the dumbest f I have ever met. With the collapse of the supposed documentary, Edema headed farther into Afghanistan alone, making it to the eastern region sometime in December 2001. Once there, he made his way to the front line of a battle against several hundred Al-Qaeda fighters. But he wasn't there to fight. He was there to network. He seized the opportunity to make as many contacts as he could, offering interviews to the media as well as establishing contacts with Northern Alliance military commanders. Before long, he was the go-to guy, mainly because the US military typically limited their interactions with reporters and he was more than willing to talk. He portrayed himself as special forces and a counterterrorism expert with ties to high-level government officials. Edema's tall tales would have you believe that he alone fought the Taliban and the Northern Alliance was simply there to witness his greatness. But in a short yet scathing rebuke of his big claims, an actual CIA operative who was in the area at the same time stated, quote, We only had 80 guys involved in our Afghanistan operations, and Edema wasn't one of them. As his time in Afghanistan continued, he started selling photos and video footage, supposedly of secret training camps, to many of the major news networks. He was taking in large amounts of money for the material, reportedly as much as $250,000 for rebroadcasting rights, and very few questioned the authenticity. CNN and NBC decided not to air any of Edema's footage. When they had their experts review the footage, they concluded that the scenes were staged and was indeed a fake. Several things stood out. The Al-Qaeda fighters would every now and then break into English and at times start laughing. Experts also quickly noticed that whatever form of training the men in the video were doing, it was nothing like how the terrorists were known to train. With his credibility in serious question at those two networks, he still managed to sell videos to the BBC, ABC, and the Boston Globe, to name just a few. It was also during this time that Jack Edema became involved in a book being written by the author of his favorite movie, The Green Berets, the same movie starring John Wayne that inspired him to join the army 25 years earlier. Robin Moore had written the best-selling book back in the mid-60s and was now working on a book about the hunt for bin Laden. He used Edema as a major resource for information, photos, and contributions. Moore relied heavily on Edema's input. But without the author's permission or knowledge, Edema made numerous revisions and wrote several new chapters which were unknowingly included when it went to print. Moore claimed he didn't recognize the final manuscript. His book had become a work of pure fiction. Task Force Dagger, The Hunt for Bin Laden was published in 2003 and featured the adventures of, you guessed it, Jack, a special forces operative. Robin Moore quickly disassociated himself from it, and not long after, the publisher, Random House, stopped printing copies. It seemed almost every project Edema was involved in turned into some kind of disaster. But it would be his participation in a bizarre international human rights incident 
that would prove to be his undoing. Task Force Saber 7 Edema's questionable team of Rambos carried out raids all over Kabul, detaining and interrogating those they considered suspects. Their headquarters was a rented house that they converted into a private prison with an office, holding cells, and interrogation rooms. This fake military team was able to secure support from multiple international teams as they carried out the raids. Edema secured assistance from explosive experts in a NATO-led team called ISAF. ISAF later admitted that they believed that Task Force Sabre 7 was an authorized security team. They believed they were providing legitimate support to a legitimate security agency. When we realized that there was an organization that was operating without uh, coordinating their actions with ISAF, um, we uh, asked the question of the coalition if they uh, knew of the name of this uh, force and who, who, this, who these people were. Indeed, they did. And uh, we realized that, in fact, we were operating, we had been providing support to an organization that was uh, acting outside the law. The task force also received support from the Northern Alliance, but they went on record officially denying any relationship with Edema. The U.S. government also confirmed that they had no connections to the so-called task force, but that they were aware of their activities. Uh, I would treat with uh, a great deal of uh, skepticism any claim by Mr. Edema that he was working for the U.S. government. I can tell you uh, absolutely that he did not work for the coalition. He was not in our employ at any time. We did not give him taskings or missions. The U.S. government did, however, admit to one official interaction. In May of 2004, Adima's team delivered a prisoner to coalition forces, claiming that he was a high-ranking Taliban member. But once the terrified prisoner was in U.S. custody, he was quickly released, after authorities confirmed Adima had misidentified him. The coalition did receive a detainee from Mr. Adima. We took the detainee in the first place because Mr. Adima represented him as someone that we were interested in. Once we determined that was not the case, we released the detainee immediately. And in the event, in this event where we did accept the person, we, we did it as we would have accepted any terrorist who uh, we were interested in uh, taking uh, out of commission. In another of Adima's raids, the team detained an Afghan Supreme Court judge they suspected of an assassination plot against the country's education minister. It wasn't long after that incident that things started to go very, very wrong for Jack Edema and his dubious team of terrorist hunters. Shortly after the raid on the judge's home, the U.S. military distributed posters advising that Edema was wanted for interfering with military operations and that he was considered armed and dangerous. On July 4, 2004, while Americans back home were celebrating Independence Day, the U.S. Central Command in Afghanistan released the following advisory. Quote, U.S. citizen Jonathan K. Edema has represented himself as an American government and or military official. The public should be aware that Edema does not represent the American government, and we do not employ him. 24 hours later, Afghan police raided Edema's private prison, arresting every member of Task Force Sabre 7. Authorities found eight detainees, some wearing hoods, while others were hanging by their feet. All eight prisoners were eventually cleared of any connection to terrorist groups and were released. Edema and his team were charged with operating an unauthorized private prison, torture, and entering Afghanistan illegally. Fred Gomez Carrasco was a notorious drug cartel boss from San Antonio. After years earning millions and running from the cops, Carrasco was serving a life sentence when he decided to break out of the Walls Unit, the oldest prison in Texas. Carrasco and two henchmen took over the prison library. They held teachers and librarians captive as Carrasco bartered for his freedom. Now there's only one way that these people will see the light again, and that's for you to cooperate. The standoff set off one of the worst hostage crises in American history, the 1974 Huntsville Prison Siege. This will be our last day to live if, if, if somebody doesn't come through and help us. They're desperate men and they mean business. He's fixing to shoot me. You know, I'm fixing to die if you don't do something. 
right now. And the rest of us in there are going to die, too. These people don't have anything to lose, and they're serious. And it's all on tape. Fred, the governor signed for you. The governor wants to talk to you. He can shove it. From Imperative Entertainment, this is Standoff. Dead or alive, I'm going out. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The trial, which included Edema, two other Americans, and four Afghan team members, was constantly interrupted by Edema, who was prone to outbursts and rants. He would often give impromptu interviews to the press who packed the courtroom. Always in pursuit of the media spotlight, the fast talker would stress connections to various high-ranking officials and government agencies until order was restored. So you were working, you were working with U.S. knowledge, with U.S. government knowledge? We were in touch with the Pentagon sometimes five times a day at the highest level, every day. They've denied Which us. They've denied you officials? completely. Well, we're prepared to show emails and correspondence and tape-recorded conversations that show that that's not true. Why did the coalition put out that email denying any knowledge, denying that you had any links to U.S. military, U.S. government? Uh, we do not know why that is, but we do know that some of the guys we took were extremely high-level terrorists. As an example, so you say on the you document... Have, you say you had contact, but were you not rebuffed by them? Did they actually condone in any way what you were doing? How, how do you feel about being sort of let go by the Americans? <laughs> You can't use that quote. <laughs> well, there you go. That's the quote, my dear. <laughs> At times, the trial appeared more like a bad television sitcom and less like an organized court of law. The mood, however, became quite serious when several of Edema's former detainees took the stand. Each one recounted how they were hooded, beaten, denied food, and subjected to simulated drownings. Although he argued that his team used only nonviolent interrogation techniques, in the end, no one believed him. All of Edema's attempts to convince the court that he and his team were operating with government authorization counted for nothing. On September 15, 2004, the members of Task Force Sabre 7 were found guilty of all charges. Edema received a 10-year prison sentence to be served in an Afghanistan jail. The other two Americans received sentences of 10 to 8 years, while the Afghan members were handed down between 1 to 4 year sentences for their involvement. Subsequent appeals cut the team's sentences in half, but a pardon from the country's president, Hamid Karzai, meant that the members of Task Force Sabre 7 were free after only a couple of years. Edema was released in April 2007, but in typical fashion caused yet another incident when he refused to leave his cell. He demanded that the government of Afghanistan return what he estimated to be half a million dollars worth of equipment seized from his headquarters when he was arrested. He also demanded that the U.S. government provide him with documents confirming their connection. No action was ever taken to meet his demands, and nearly two months later, on June 2, 2007, Jack Edema finally walked out of his cell and was immediately flown out of Afghanistan. This might have been the part of the story where Jack Edema returns home to his wife and their hotel for pets back in North Carolina. But no. After filing and losing multiple lawsuits against the U.S. and Afghan governments, and anyone else he could think of, Jack Edema headed to Mexico. The terrorist bounty hunter hung up his interrogation equipment to become a tour boat captain. As the owner of Blue Lagoon Boat Tours, the man, now going by the pirate moniker Black Jack Edema, was still running toward trouble. It didn't take long before Mexican police issued warrants for his arrest after he was charged with domestic violence and involuntary confinement. Jack Edema has resurfaced, apparently holed up in a house in Mexico. According to local news reports, local police in Mexico want very much police to talk to him about accusations that he held people in his house against their will. Uh, there are other more lascivious accusations too, none of which we can... A standoff ensued while Edema barricaded himself inside a house, but he was eventually taken into custody. This incident, which was reported by both Mexican and U.S. media, was to be his last stand. Black Jack Edema died alone in Mexico in 2012 due to complications resulting from AIDS. He had no immediate survivors, and it took Mexican authorities months to confirm his identity, as no one came to claim his body. When news of his death was finally confirmed, the press made their opinions about him known. One journalist wrote, quote, 
His death at age 55 marks the end of perhaps the most colorful, unpleasant, and self-dramatizing character to tread North Carolina soil since Blackbeard. Another wrote, quote, Edema was pure trouble, and his death brings us closer to the end of a weird era, when sociopathic frauds can be taken seriously just because they looked the military part. U.S. media, who had been the repeated victim of his relentless self-promotion and questionable contributions, clearly pulled no punches. But then again, neither did Black Jack Edema. True is a production of Imperative Entertainment. This episode of True was researched and written by me. The executive producer is Jason Hoke of Imperative Entertainment. Cover art and design was created by Jenna Sullivan. True was created and is produced by me. Comments? Questions? Get a hold of us at podcasts at imperativeentertainment.com. A huge thanks for listening. As promised, here's a preview of American Hostage. And while you're listening, follow American Hostage wherever you get your podcasts, or you can binge all eight episodes right now on Amazon Music. This podcast is based on a true story. He says he had been planning this for four years, according to my information here. Did he come in with a shotgun? Evidently, he made a bad real estate deal, and he's going to settle it. Looks like we're going to be here quite a long time. Good afternoon. I'm Fred Heckman with WIBC. Tuesday, February 8th. 1977. For me, there are three tenets of journalism. One, don't make it personal. Two, don't pick a side. And three, don't become the story. I broke all three of those in the span of a single phone call. Hello, WIBC. This is really Fred Heckman. Yes. <laughs> we got something developed in downtown. Something developed. You're going to help me straighten this out for me, Mr. Heckman. You want an interview? Yes. The WIBC News Division speaking directly to the hostage taker is a disaster. What they're doing right now is character assassination. If he doesn't trust the system. He's a psychopath. He needs an outlet. You can't go down. He does have a background at explosion. Anything you say, anything you do, you get this guy's head blown off. Every hour that goes by, the hostage becomes less of a person, less of a human. Do you have a wife and family, Fred? I sure do, Toby. Let's say somebody said, we're going to take your car, we're going to take your house, we're going to take your wife, we're going to take your children. Would you be ready to kill Heckman? Well, I, I Would you be ready to kill Heckman? I'd be awfully mad, sir. American Hostage is an Amazon original and criminal content production starring John Hamm. Follow American Hostage wherever you get your podcasts. Or you can binge all eight episodes right now on Amazon Music and Wondery Plus. Fred Gomez Carrasco was a notorious drug cartel boss from San Antonio. After years earning millions and running from the cops, Carrasco was serving a life sentence when he decided to break out of the Walls Unit, the oldest prison in Texas. Carrasco and two henchmen took over the prison library. They held teachers and librarians captive as Carrasco bartered for his freedom. Now there's only one way that these people will see the light again. And that's for you to cooperate. The standoff set off one of the worst hostage crises in American history, the 1974 Huntsville Prison Siege. This will be our last day to live if, if, if somebody doesn't come through and help us. They're desperate men and they mean business. He's fixing to shoot me. You know, I'm fixing to die if you don't do something right now. And the rest of us in there are going to die too. These people don't have anything to lose and they're serious. And it's all on tape. Fred, the governor signed for you. The governor wants to talk to you. He can shove it. From Imperative Entertainment, this is Standoff. Better alive going out. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.